Greg Quinones, welcome to the Gnostic Media Podcast. This is an exciting topic, and uh, I, I had you on the RBN show a couple of months back, and I heard about your work. You contacted me, actually, and you were also on Clint Richardson's show. And uh, anyway, this is a hugely important topic. We're going to be discussing oil and petroleum and gasoline and peak oil and all of that good stuff. But this isn't going to be the typical information that most people have heard over the last 50 years or so regarding oil. You know, and I should mention, uh, you know, just for disclosure, you are an oil man. And it's kind of funny, you're, you're actually in, in your basement because uh, <laughs> we were having signal troubles. So that's why you're there. But uh, anyway, he's he's in the basement doing a show about oil. He, he just wanted to get closer to the subject matter. <laughs> and I'm in the dungeon. That's you're, right. You're in the dungeon. So Greg, welcome to the show. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right. So, uh, Greg, why don't you start off by telling the audience a little bit about yourself and your background, your education, that sort of stuff, as well as your business. Well, as well as my business? Okay. Well, I'm, uh, I'm in uh, production and process of crude oil, uh, which means I help the operators get the oil out of the ground, move it through the pipeline so it can make its way to the refinery. And so I offer a number of different products and technologies with an emphasis on environmentally friendly solutions. And um, challenging times right now in the oil industry with the price, it's, it's, really, it's really hurting a lot of people and a lot of operators. But I got into this uh, a little over three years ago, into this end of it. Prior to that, I was involved in investment banking and I worked for Fidelity, for Bear Stearns. I started back in 1989. Are, are you the guy that caused the uh, Enron collapse? <laughs> no, I got out of there before. <laughs> <laughs> I actually went to work in uh, New York mainly because I wanted to learn how, how the money system works. Because I wanted to start a company, a business, and I felt, well, the, this controls everything. So what better way to learn about it. And I'm, I'm right outside of New York City, only a few miles away. I live seven miles away from New York City in northern New Jersey. So what better way? So I went in and got an internship at Bear Stearns, just walked in with a suit and said, you'd make the biggest mistake you ever made if you don't hire me. I'll sweep your floors. I'll do whatever you want me to do. But you want me to, uh, but I want to learn this business and I want to learn it now. And if you don't hire me, I'll go someplace else. Now, you can never do that today. But back then, they kind of looked you in the eye and said, all right, we'll give you a shot. It's no sweat off their brag, their back, right? I said, well, you know, you show up every day. We'll give you a $300 a week draw against your salary. And if you don't make it in the first uh, 30 days, we'll show you the door and you're, you get out. So and in the meantime, you study hard, get your Series 7 license, Series 63 license, and away you can go. So... It was, uh, it was a great time. It was a different world back then. But back in those days when people had money, there's a lot of money. People have a lot of money. Say, uh, they have a lot of money in, in assets, but they don't have a lot of money like in the bank anymore. Ever since 2001 when Greenspan or 2002 when Greenspan lowered interest rates to 1%, way below the level of inflation, there's... There's been reverse of angel capitalism and has reverted to venture capitalism or vulture capitalism. It's a big problem. It's one of the main reasons why we have more businesses dying today that are being opened up and why we're in re really, really serious trouble. And look, nothing, nothing happens in our world before oil. We are all 100% dependent upon it, whether we want to admit that to ourselves or not. All right. Well, well, let me ask you this, uh, since you said that, we might as well start off with a really simple question. What is oil? Oil is a process of, my personal belief, it is a process of vulcanization. You may call it like the lifeblood of this world we live on. It is produced deep inside, and none of us really know how 
we all make, there are tons of theories, you know, decaying biomass, you know, dinosaurs. That's, that's, uh, that's pretty much nonsense. Just to let the cat out of the bag a little bit, uh, it looks as though the whole fossil fuel idea has been entirely false all along. It has. It has. It's been disproven many times over just simply because of the depths that they go to find oil. Now, uh, just before we started recording, a, a geoengineer, geo something or other, now I'm forgetting. Anyway, his name is uh, Sean Phillips. He has written a paper on this, and he sent it to me before the show when I just finished reading it. And it, uh, it does confirm everything that you are saying. So I'm going to schedule a follow-up show with him as part of the series on this. And uh, to go into more of the the science, you know, and the hardcore facts about how all of this works. But, um, you know, the the evidence is apparently there and there are so many contradictions in the official version of the story that we've all been sold. And it's an optimal word, sold. (laughs) Right. Well, and, uh, you know, so all levels of this, the the peak oil scam scandal, whatever you want to call it, uh, that, uh, you know, you talked about last time you were on the show on the RBN show that, uh, oil wells, what was it in Washington and and Southern California that were capped in the 1940s are full again and or in Texas. And we're seeing this all over the place. So if, Oil is a fossil fuel, and it was made <clears throat> 10, 50 million years ago or whatever, and once we use it up, that's it. Then how the heck would empty oil wells refill? Well, look, they John D. Rockefeller is the one who got oil classified as a fossil fuel. Back and, in, and of course, he ran Standard Oil, isn't that correct? Yes, yes. And, and the reason being that in anything in economics, there is no profits in surplus and excess capacity. There's only profits in shortages. So by deeming it and creating this peak oil, and the peak oil myth didn't just start in the 1950s. It started, it's been over 150 years <clears throat> because... By saying that the oil was going to run out, that allowed them to charge more. And by charging more, it led to expansion of the industry, hired a lot of people. And, but what we have right now in our world today is we we have a dropping demand because of overcapacity around the world. The world economy is in serious, serious trouble. And China has been supporting the world's demand which has been supporting the price of oil literally for the last 15 years. Uh, but now they are, they are reached their peak potential. They're not building ghost cities anymore. <laughs> I don't see how they could anymore. They've racked up almost $50 trillion in debt to do so. And all that's coming to an end. So the world needs far less oil than it did before. And there's an enormous amount of it sloshing around out there. There's over 100 million barrels of oil on ships floating around, just being used as uh, floating storage vessels. So you think the days of the $4.50 gallon for gas in Southern California is over? I think for the foreseeable future, they're over until the next logical conclusion, in my opinion, is they have to get commerce unstuck and nothing gets commerce unstuck better than a war. Great. All right. So, well, you know, how I got into this was I came across a video by someone working with the Ayn Rand Institute, who I mentioned in the last show, but I couldn't remember his name. His name was Alex Epstein, and he's got a video, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. We were told our fossil fuel usage would bring ecological disaster on a cataclysmic scale. Earth was supposed to be uninhabitable by now. Yet, life is better than ever. 
people around the world have climbed out of unspeakable poverty. By any measure, our environment is better than it's ever been. This, all powered by coal, oil, and natural gas. But how? How could the experts have been so wrong? Not only wrong, but hysterical and reactionary and rude, stifling progress in the process. I'm Alex Epstein, founder of the Center for Industrial Progress, and I have a question. Isn't it time someone made the moral case for the use of more fossil fuels? Wind and solar power remain unreliable. Fossil fuels burn cleaner and cheaper than ever to advance our growing world. They save lives in operating rooms, fight famine, heat and cool homes in the most extreme places. Without fossil fuels, society slides backwards. It's good that we use fossil fuels. Our world would be better if we used more. We can no longer deny the big picture, the real picture. The truth must be exposed. Now, he's he's targeting the, the issue of how oil is the best, but uh, what's the misnomer in Epstein's title there? I think he's spot on. Well, but it, but but uh, moral case for fossil fuels. If they're not fossil fuels, there there is a misnomer. There isn't that correct? Yeah. Well, yes. I th I think that so many people, even in the oil industry, have accepted the myths that have been promoted out there. So well, so, well, it, well, everybody has, and the hippies are always out uh, promoting. Uh, you know, renewable energy. So I've got a number of questions here and everything, and we'll get through. And I, I did post you the questions there in the Skype chat as well. But, um, you know, so people who want to know more about this, and, and Sean, uh, the guy that I mentioned a little bit ago that sent the paper, he is a geophysicist and a co-author of the uh, paper. And I will be posting his uh, paper in the show notes to this episode as well as to a hopefully upcoming paper with him and it's uh, let's see hydrocarbons in the context of a solid quantified growing and radiating earth and uh, so that is the title of his paper and it's uh, um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce half the rest of that but it looks like he published it in uh, 2007 so quite a while ago so you know, it's taken uh, eight years <laughs> just to, <laughs> since he published that uh, to, I don't know. I, I, I haven't been really seeing any of this. I mean, I worked promoting hemp for fuel for years, thinking uh, that all of the fossil fuel uh, peak oil thing was false. And, uh, or I mean, excuse me, true and realizing that it's false. And it, it comes you to, it brings you to completely different uh conclusions than sure. what we've all been told and uh obviously if it's not a fossil fuel and there is no peak oil then and and carbon is the basis of all life then there's something else entirely going on here which is a thriving of life versus a crushing of life essentially would you agree sure. with that all right, go ahead. Absolutely. I was going to say that it's the burning of oil through vulcanization that we have all this green, abundant life around us. They put the carbon into the atmosphere that the plants breathe and they expel the oxygen. It's a symbiotic relationship. And, and also what to these people that promote this nonsense idea of the carbon footprint want people to believe is that anything that gives off carbon dioxide, such as humans and animals, et cetera, that's bad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, plants that consume carbon dioxide, they need that to grow. So obviously the more carbon dioxide that's out there, the more plentiful it is, the faster the plants are going to grow to immediately put out more oxygen. Exactly. So there is a, com a constant balance it, regardless if there's less plant life or more, you know, the more pollution there is, the more plant life there's going to be. Is that correct? Depending upon the type of pollution, yes. Right. But and so hydrocarbon we, pollution, yeah, there'll be an abundant plant life. And that's and, and we should be distinct that this is entirely separate from petrochemical pollution. 
Exactly. Things that have been uh, highly chemicalized with various known like chlorines and, you know, xylenes and the whole alphabet soup of chemicals. They're all derived from oil as part of the refining process. So they're all in the oil anyway. But it's sometimes the blending of different chemicals there. It's, it's vinegar and water. You know, it's like blending. Uh, it's like a, a, a blending ammonia and bleach. You know, sounds like a good idea, but it could kill you if you do. They're not, those are two elements that are really not, not supposed to be brought together. All and, right. Uh, well, you know, just uh, going into the, going, returning to the commodities trading and Enron, what can you say about that? Obviously that caused a, a massive fiasco and we saw the, the increase, the false uh, increase of prices, et cetera, due to a lot of this bogus trading. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Enron being in the 90s, that was a very interesting time. We were, um, we were, we, we really reached our peak back in the 90s, the mid 90s, as far as our economy works on an, on ever growing inflation greater than previously created inflation, but not too much. See, inflation is life, deflation is death. And the powers to be will do anything to uh, keep their game going. They see, they don't want the collapse that everybody talks about, because if they did, they could very easily have accomplished it years ago, 20 years ago, they could have let this whole thing collapse. So Enron was, Enron in itself was doing every, the same thing that many other companies were doing in its day, but um, somebody kind of had to go because they kind of had to make the way because the world was changing and they knew it come the year 2000, 2001. It was very, you know, very pitiful time. That's why we had September 11th. Okay. Because remember, war is the greatest distraction of major collapses and it set off a huge amount of money, the lowering of interest rates to be directed towards China to build cities that nobody lives in. They built over 200 ghost cities over there, not to mention a vast internet work of manufacturing facilities, factories, highways. Uh, and that takes a great deal of commodities and materials besides oil, everything from cement, timber, gypsum, iron ore, copper, so they were the support mechanism that held, that kept the prices up for commodities worldwide for the, literally for the last 15 years. And because without them, we would have collapsed back in 2001. But, and I think what they, what they like to see is that next step would be to do the same thing with India, for India to be the source of demand for worldwide commodities, including oil, but they're not ready. They probably need another 20 years of infrastructure work and development before they'll be ready for that. So the peak oil, and back to that a little bit, the peak oil myth fed right into the scarcity of oil, which allowed a lot of money to be, a lot of money to be made. So obviously the long gas lines that I remember when I was six or seven years old in the seventies, that was all a, a big farce essentially. Well, that didn't have anything to do with oil shortage more than we were, we were getting far less oil from Saudi Arabia because of the petrodollar and, you know, they, they didn't really want to go along. They wanted to continue to be able to redeem U.S. dollars for gold when Nixon took us off the gold standard and we went to the petrodollar. Uh, they didn't like the idea too much, so they restricted exporting oil to the United States. And at that time, we didn't have our domestic production had fallen to between three and five million barrels per day. And that was not enough to sustain, you know, at least we use, uh, I think we use about close to 10 million barrels of oil a day or more in the United States every single day. So even back then, today it's, today it's because of population, it's even more. But we do have the capability of producing all of our own oil between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. In fact, we get most of our oil, by the way, from Canada. 
Well, and apparently uh, Canada is just, uh, they've been blocking oil pipelines and are trying to stop production and industry up in Canada because of all of this Agenda 21. Do you know about that? Yeah, they're, um, look, there's there's a lot of people that want to bring the scarcity of oil back. And because they've known that, look, if China is off the table, we have to put a lot of operators out of business. So there's, there's a lot of gaming going on with the price. And, but I think so far what they've tried to do isn't working the way they really wanted it to. I think they would really like oil in the 55 and above, maybe 55 to 65. That way the right people could still stay in business, but it would put frackers and unconventional uh, companies that's really close to the borders, whether they can even maintain their debt service at that price. What the $45 per barrel oil is doing it's it's disrupting everybody right now there are major projects being canceled in the north sea gulf of mexico canada russia china is canceling projects so this this is costing yeah, because a lot. and there's already because there's already so much surplus because there is yeah and well, okay and, and the, if and if all of that production continued right now the price would continue to fall because obviously there would be can you know increasing surplus well what we have to say in the business is you can't put 10 gallons of oil in a 5 gallon bucket so you can keep pumping is you can keep pumping until the cows come home but if you don't have the system to store that oil it's just going to spill all over the ground and what would, would what right now we're, we can produce more than what we can store, or we know that we're on a trajectory that within the next six to eight months, we're going to have to shut down all of the wells because every storage tank in Cushing, Houston, New York, and all the other supporting tank farm systems and pipeline systems, there isn't going to be any place to store the oil. It's just, we're not using enough, uh, you know, our, our, we still have a high demand for gasoline, but gasoline only represents about 40% of a barrel of oil. The rest of it are your kerosenes, your jet fuels, your heavy oils like uh, diesel fuel and home heating oil. Then you have your asphalts and your petrochemicals. And with demand for virtually all of them flat or falling, uh, we just can't produce oil only to produce gasoline. That doesn't make any sense. We're still left. Now, with that, there's going to be so much waste created. Right now, they waste very little in a barrel of oil. So, All right. Well, let's jump over to a different subject. Let's discuss oil as a natural, renewable resource. And that's something that people don't want to hear. But mm -hmm. this is actually what's beginning to be exposed and what's uh, subverting all of this propaganda about uh, peak oil that we've heard about and you know there's been podcasts dedicated to this like the sea realm podcast and this guy kmo who's constantly put out peak oil the end of production and everything but what you're saying is it's quite the opposite we're going to have such a surplus of oil uh and and the surplus of oil is actually causing production of oil to stop and that's actually going to cause the big economic break mm -hmm. which is why i said they're they have to get commerce unstuck get the price up and not just oil get the demand for all of the commodities going again moving forward and nothing does that better than war i i don't think there's any other way out of their box so that's why we had paris mm -hmm. that's why we have all these things going on around us right now great well <laughs> <laughs> i don't it's horrible right. but so break down to people and explain to them how oil is a natural renewable resource and how everything that, you know, let's, let's dive into how everything that we know is backward. Okay. Oil is produced by our planet. Um, whatever this is, however it does, and everybody just throws out the theories. Nobody really knows for sure how it's created, the heat, pressure, elements that are deep in the earth that come together, part of the vulcanization process. And this oil gets 
pushed up by pressures deep, deep down in the earth towards the surface. It might take millions of years for that oil to reach the surface, but it will reach the surface nonetheless. It's just only a matter of time. As they say, it's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when. And it was discovered in the United States by Spanish explorers when they were scouting the, uh, the uh, bayous around Louisiana. Uh, they had actually crashed, ran aground in Galveston, Texas. And this was in, um, I think, 15, the year 1514. And when they came across the mouth of the Mississippi River, the water was all black because the fissure had opened up and all the oil had spilled up. The Indians used to, to gather oil coming up through fissures, mix it with grass and mud, and use it to waterproof their boats they used to make. And it was through that that the Spanish realized they could repair the hull of their ship that had been damaged when it ran aground and sail back to Spain and brought all this oil with them. And the Chinese, because they had been trading with the Chinese, had been using, had learned to refine oil just by basically putting it through a still to extract kerosene so they could lamp, light lamps with it. And in Eurasia, like Azerbaijan, in other places, there are natural, um, there are natural, uh, what do we call them? Like they, they built around gas vents. They built uh, like lanterns. And these lanterns are still lit to these days, to this day. They've been, they ignited them 3,000 years ago and the flames never gone out. So they've known about this for a long time. They knew that it was, that's why they called it black gold, by the way because the Spanish were on a quest for gold. And it, it very, it took a few hundred more years until the Industrial Revolution. But once they realized the other valuable things that they can make from oil, then it was, we became a, we became a petro-industrial based society back then, 150 years ago. So. Try, to, try to explain to people as best you can how it's not this polluting, and, and, and we're talking about the hydrocarbons and petroleum and its direct products. We're not talking about petrochemicals. Mm -hmm. But explain to people how it is this natural renewable resource is what I'm getting at and why mm -hmm. we shouldn't be worried about, you know, burning... Uh, you know, gasoline, et cetera, that, uh, you know, this, this cycle is there in nature. How can you break that down for people as best you can? Well, the best way is to realize that oil has been burning for millions of years through volcanoes. Um, it catches fire. They've known about this since its discovery, since the Chinese figure out how to use it, that they can make lamps out of it. Uh, it's... As far as like a renewable resource, yes, it's renewable in the fact that the earth is consistently producing more. However it's doing it, it's doing it, it's continually being pushed up to the surface. Our burning it isn't destroying anything because the world's going to, the world will burn it or break it down. And, and, and essentially what would happen, <clears throat> what I'm gathering is that if we weren't pulling it up out of the ground, it's going to explode upward anyway through volcanoes and through fissures, et cetera, regardless. So if we're burning it or not, those hydrocarbons do come up to the surface and do feed the environment, do provide the nutrients for all the plant and small animal life that then goes up the, the food chain. But it is essentially the core of the base or it's the the blood of the earth essentially that that kicks off all carbon based life including ourselves is that exactly okay that's so it. That's but it in a nutshell but but essentially it's either going to be sucked out of the ground by us and used and burned or it's going to be shot out of the ground due to the pressure of it being there and volcanoes and everything regardless. And then as the volcano erupts, all of those hydrocarbons, et cetera, are going to spill into the environment 
regardless. And we can't, you know, so basically everybody's car is just a, a tiny little volcano that maybe in a, in some way might delay greater volcanic volcanic reaction. And would, would you go so far as to suggest that our oh, use I've of it might slow volcanics uh, volcanoes? It could, it could. I will say this on that subject, volcanoes, Mount Pinatubo, when it erupted in 1993 in the Philippines, it was a major, major eruption. And that one day, the first day of its eruption, it launched more hydrocarbons, burnt hydrocarbons into the atmosphere than all of humanity had from that day up to that point. One day, one volcano. So all right, so uh, our little cars, in we can create smog, we can create all sorts of problems, we can create situations like China when they're they're burning vast amounts of coal and other things. It can be unsightly, yes. Is it killing the planet? No. But it's like anything. What I tell people, look, oil is a natural substance that's born of the earth. So how can anything that's natural be a pollutant? Okay, that's, but that's we like, we could say uranium is natural, but you know, I mean, obviously, we, if we have too much concentrated uranium, we could have a huge problem on our hands, couldn't we? Anything within nature that we could have a high concentration of can be deadly. You know, the uh, volcanoes also produce vast amounts of sulfuric acid. So, if you're around in an acidified lake in a volcanic area, it's not a good idea to go take a swim, not unless you want to keep your skin. But through time and through dissipation, those acids are actually have very beneficial effects on the overall ecology. And oil is no different. In, in concentration, oil is very dangerous to, it will kill you. Uh, you know, there's, there's gases in there, there's elements in there that could kill you in a couple of minutes time if you were to inhale them. But they dissipate and they feed other forms of life that we're dependent upon. You know, saying that oil is a pollutant is, to me, in my opinion about it, it's like saying that oil is a pollutant is like saying that the oceans are polluted because the water's salty. Now, if you drank seawater, it will kill you. Not a good idea to drink that, okay? But you could eat the fish out of it. Right. And other right. things and other, obviously, other life forms are adopted to seawater use and other life forms mushrooms uh small animal life are adopted to eat petroleum mm -hmm. and tar and all of that there's a uh, a lot of uh molecular bacteria that's in the oil and that's one of the big mysteries of, of science is how did that bacteria get there when you're getting oil from 8, 10, 12, 20,000 feet below the surface, how did bacteria get down there? But it's in there. And under the right conditions, those bacteria come to life and they start to consume and break down all the elements in the oil. And then as they poop, they produce a lot of the nutrients and elements that other higher life forms feed upon. And like we're saying it moves up the food chain. And so we're, we're all, whether we want to recognize it, we are here because of things like oil. If oil was not here, then life would have not been able to prosper on this planet the way it has. And when you think of, you know, how intricate, how intricately oil is tied into everything, it's pretty dumbfounding to say the least how it's the the core of all life and then when you factor in all of the the propaganda and the people selling all the peak oil propaganda and the end of civilization and all of this stuff like again like the sea realm podcast etc uh you you know you have you see a whole everything on a whole new level that that is astounding to say the very least mm -hmm. yeah it's uh it's sad what they've done but they are if if we look at things through they try to keep us like children and it's, i just think it's really frustrating for people don't realize like we're our lives are dependent upon it 
Our economies are dependent upon everything that you have, um, you know, your homes, your, not just your cars. It's not just gasoline. It's, it's in all of your products. It's, it made the clothes that you're wearing. Okay. It brought the clothes to the place where you bought the clothes, uh, your eyeglasses, your headphones, the plastics, the food in the refrigerator behind you. Okay. The paneling on your walls, everything is, is there because of oil. If there was no oil, there would be, there would be nothing. We would Some of that oil back in- there might be from the 1920s and good old hand saws. But. <laughs> you know, I mean, we could go back, <coughs> excuse me, even, um, even if we went back to, let's say, coal. Coal is still a derivative of oil. It's, it was part of the process. Right. So I'm not a geoengineer. I'm not a geoscientist. But I, and all these guys can know all this. I just go on what my eyes see and what makes common sense to me. Yeah. And I've always you want to felt. Tip your camera down a little bit further there. Sorry about that. Okay. That's all right. Sorry about that. I've always felt that if they lie to us about everything, we all know that. And so if they're telling us that we have peak oil, my first inclination is, I don't think so. I think there's probably more oil than they know what to do with. I think these last 15 years, when they decided to explore unconventional drilling, particularly hydraulic fracturing, that they knew that they could extract a vast amount of oil that's locked in shale formations, which is just rock in deep formations that lock the oil in or cap it so that it it doesn't pool like in a normal formation or reservoir, okay? You have to break the rock in order to release the oil. And they discovered the process in the 1940s, but it's a costly process. And as long as China was supporting that demand, like we discussed earlier, then it made sense because they knew that it would probably make sense to reroute Middle Eastern oil to Chinese demands. And if Chinese, if China was to be the production, uh, the, the manufacturing and production center of the world, they were going to need a vast sum of oil in order to accomplish that. And we could satisfy all of our domestic needs with what we get from Canada, Mexico, and our own shale formations here. So... I think the decision was made. There was some new innovations and technologies brought about, some developments with some of the frac fluids and some of the aggregates they used to space the rock open. And I don't want to get too technical in the process of how it all works. But there's been a lot of innovations that were made. And also they knew that by bringing in a high price environment, you're going to there's going to be a tremendous amount of innovation that's going to take place because everybody's going to want to try and profit from the boom. And you profit by the boom by innovating and developing technologies, bringing them to market when the price is, when the price is high or when the demand is high. And if you can get them, if you can get the case studies and get a few things open, and you got to put up with a lot of nonsense, don't get me wrong, but your technologies can make you very, very rich. And so there's, there's been a tremendous amount of innovations that have been developed over the last 15 years since the oil price started to consistently rise, particularly in the last six years. I have a personal friend of mine that's developed a, a fracking technology that he just, you know, came up with the idea and has been core testing it. And his, his technique can increase the yield of a frack well by 40% and eliminate the need for aggregates and waters and probably most of the chemicals that are required in fracking today. And lower the cost to as little as 20, 15 to $20 so it lo- per lowers the lowers the pollution factor, brings it up cleaner and, uh, cleaner in, and in, increases, in, uh, increases production. Exactly. All right, so... Are oil spills beneficial? Are they dangerous? And how for each of those? 
Oil spills are dangerous for a short term. Yes. Like I said, in, in the immediate aftermath of an oil spill, there are going to be high concentrations of H2, H2S gases, very, very flammable environments. If you inhale it, you could die. Wildlife will, will die. But as soon as the bacteria begins to, um, begins to you know, do its job, Consume couple, it, yeah. Consume it within a couple, probably within a short time, probably with less than a year. There, the dangers of any type of gas uh, inhalation dangers will subside. It will be unsightly, probably for a number of years, and Could people be five or ten years, and people can remember the Exxon Valdez, etc. So. Sure. You know, and uh, in our show on RBN, you discussed how the ocean floor pours out some 12 million gallons or barrels of oil a day. I've heard that some estimates in the Gulf of Mexico that there's well over a million barrels of oil being spilled every day just through natural fissures. But we're talking about depths of three, four, five thousand feet, uh, six thousand feet. At those depths, the water pressure is so immense and it's so cold, that oil never reaches the surface. As soon, because it's hot and it's reaching an environment where the temperature is anywhere between 35 and 38 degrees Fahrenheit. And it would obviously like be, cold temperature it, it would it's obviously be uh, warming that temperature though some, wouldn't it? Well, it's not, these aren't volcanic vents. So immediately around, it's coming out hot, obviously. But once the, the cold air and the, the cold water and the pressure, it turns it sort of into sort of like a cottage cheese consistency, and it'll just settle to the bottom. And there, bacteria will go upon its settlement, will bury it, and it sort of recycles itself as it begins to get buried. As it heats up, it reconstitutes. These are processes that take probably millions of years, the cycles to complete. But... Oil's been spilling out of the Gulf of Mexico long before mankind discovered it. You know, All that's right. One of the reasons why they have such great shrimp down there. <laughs> so this more, more recent spill that wiped out these shrimpers uh, along the uh, Louisiana coast, et cetera, uh, in the next five to 10 years, we can expect them to have a major boom. Is that what you're saying? We very well could. In fact, it is coming back now. The only thing that so, concerns so, me about so, the BP oil spill, that the, the, the problem is I think BP or the engineers, um, I think they were too aggressive in, in spraying core exit on the water. Now, who knows how much? They're, they're the conspiracy theorists out there who said that they were spraying vast sums of core exit. Core exit's one of these petrochemicals that's supposed to break down the oil but unfortunately, it's going to kill the bacteria that breaks it down, and it's going to kill anything else that consumes it. But there hasn't been any evidence of, of a core exit die-off in the Gulf of Mexico. So I think maybe all of that was just a bunch of propaganda that they probably didn't use nearly as much. They might have just used what they call digesters. You know, they're already – it's already the uh, – the, the enzymes and bacteria, and they spray that on top of oil to accelerate the bacterial microbes doing their job. It speeds up the process quite a bit. And that stuff is environmentally safe. There's no problem with it. But and I think, uh, who knows? I would, Corexit is a really bad substance. You know, they could just leave the oil alone and skim it, capture it. There are some great technologies. And, to and probably to, do less damage than spraying uh, extreme petrochemicals on it that way as well, right? Exactly. There are far more environmentally friendly ways. Just letting it be is – it's just, it's oil. It's, it's not processed. It's coming out of the ground. Yes, it's unsightly. But look, I think if we look at like the BP oil spill, it was not nearly as severe as we were all told. There was very little in the way of shoreline damage caused by that incident. So could it have been a, a fake event? Very possible. Could it have been an attempt by the oil industry to try and create a shortage, knowing that they needed to get oil up 
in price. But when did that happen? 2010? Something like that, Five yeah. years ago? Okay. 2010, we were... We weren't, we weren't at $100 a barrel for that could have been, I'm going to have to go back and look at March of 2010 when that happened. But the, there are many people in play in the oil industry that they need to keep oil above $80 a barrel. Uh, if they have any long-term chance of being able to maintain their businesses and moving forward, just with the cost of their operations. And particularly with offshore, because these companies are put, they've invested billions of dollars into these offshore platforms and the technologies. This is this has put millions of people around the world to work in developing these things. And they, I do believe they would like to keep the system going as long as they can. But as I say now, I think we're, we're seeing these things today and even a lot of this debate today because... I mean, the oil industry is also very good at creating its own duality, trying to control both sides of the argument. Right. And we discussed that uh, before. And I had read, in fact, I've got it up right here, a quote from uh, my article, Spies in Academic Clothing. And this is from uh, Stephen Hager, the former uh, chief editor of High Times magazine. And he says, but that's the way the spooks play their games. If there's going to be a social movement against whatever you're doing, it's best if you secretly create and orchestrate that movement against yourself right away so that it never does any unintended damage to your personal fortunes. I think that's been the mantra of the oil industry for the last hundred years. So they are b basically creating all of these hippie movements uh, against them with all of this false peak oil information, et cetera, to drive their profits. So the hippies and the protesters and uh, the peak oil people, et cetera, they all play right into that. Correct. Everybody falls right into the line. You know, there was a great movie that was produced for HBO. It had Matt Damon in it, uh, where he plays a landman. Landman is a person who goes around to people who own farms. And it takes place in rural Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania. And the fracking companies would send landmen out to offer people royalties for producing oil and gas on their land. And, of course, this movie was about how bad the oil industry was. But the, the radical hippie guy that was character that was brought in to sort of juxtapose, uh, you know, the main character's role was, wasn't an organic, you know, protester, Greenpeace kind of guy. He worked for the oil company that the Matt Damon character worked for. And that was exposed at the end. Like, do you think we wouldn't what's control the, what's the name of that of film do you remember uh you know I, I can't remember but if you google matt damon um you know landman matt damon uh, i have the screen closed i don't have my mouse here with the, my computer here in the basement i could do it but um promised land the pro that's it promised land okay <clears throat> mm -hmm. again this is just another one of these movies but it's fascinating to watch because it it, I was shocked when I saw it, to be honest with you, about at the end when they exposed this is exactly what this industry has been doing. They are almost practicing military intelligence right? in the way they operate today. And almost to the level that uh, we've been exposing elsewhere at Gnostic Media for the last several years. <laughs> exactly. And they, they probably take it on the same people that were consultants. No, no, I mean, government. you know, because everybody essentially would be relaxed. I mean, it's like, okay, so the real renewable energy then is is oil. And so as long as they keep the scarcity thing up and we're all on the uh, end of the industrial age and everything's just about to collapse because there's no more oil while they're while there are tankers everywhere floating that are full and, and can't put it anywhere, then uh, it, it keeps their their prices high and, and they can keep their illusion going. All right. In, so. the Green, in the Green River Basin of Colorado and Utah, there's over 3 trillion barrels of oil. 3 trillion. We don't have an oil shortage. And, it's, and the, only, uh, the other renewable energy is nuclear, 
which by the way, isn't dangerous. It's why it's been demonized. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we do have a couple of issues that happen with that, and we need to, you know, we need to do a whole show just on that as well. Uh, and I was going to try to save some of the nuclear stuff till the end. So, you know, it, it, apparently the main damage is, you know, with oil spills, the immediate cost is immediate animal life, the animals that get drowned in the oil that humans can't physically get to to bathe them in a solution to get the oil off. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one would be industry, et cetera, that's wiped out immediately, like the shrimp industry. But then, uh, you know, the animal life comes back in five or ten years, and the shrimp industry comes back or fi in five or ten years. So essentially... Right, so essentially everybody should be, you know, buying stock in, in shrimp fisheries right now <laughs> <laughs> it might be a good time to do that but all right yes, it's uh it's it's an easy and and you're uh, not you know and like you know we discussed in the last show you're not suggesting we be bad stewards of the earth and be careless etc you're you're for and you're protecting the environment and, and and you're you and I think you and I discussed before that you were against petro, the use of petro, petrochemicals that really are what could make the mess out of the oil industry. Mm -hmm. I say if you're going to use chemical chemicals that are born of nature, a lot of petrochemicals are, but if the blending of certain chemicals creates a super toxic side effect, those chemicals should not be used. There are natural alternatives for almost everything. For instance, we talk about the cleaning of birds, which you had mentioned with oil spills. Right. A lot of that is just oil. Uh, it's soaps that are made from polymers and orange peels. So real simple. It breaks the oil apart. It keeps it from sticking and it cleans everything up. That's That stuff cleans up oil spills too. And it's entirely non-toxic. So it's a, those again, yeah, and and, and everything smells good, <laughs> and everything smells like orange peels. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what is vulcanization? Vulcanization is, and, and just try to you know, just try to explain it the best you can. Like I said, I'm going to have Sean on to provide a lot more of the geophysics part of this stuff, but you know, just as best you can on these parts. I think whatever it is we live on, okay, whatever it is we live on, it's growing. It's maybe it's a living thing. And part of that growth is the pressure, expansion, contraction, and the heat that's created. There's that massive heat uh, produces various liquids that come together under the right circumstances that are pushed up to the surface. Many of those <clears throat> chambers are created by the lava flows themselves and they make their way to, you know, they make their way to the surface and it's, so it's, your friend's probably the better person to talk to in a, a, sure. in a geoscience way about it, but I do know they're natural. <laughs> Nobody could say that, well, because of mankind's activity here that we're causing volcanic, volcanic eruptions. That would be, a, I think, a bit silly right. for them to say. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they would like to. I'm sure. I'm sure it's been suggested means. Can can we blame volcanoes on mankind? Like, uh, I don't think we can push that that far. Now, what is abiotic oil? Abiotic oil is the oil that is formed deep in the earth, and, and that's which the juxt that's the and you know I just it's the juxtaposed theory, essentially theory, which uh, fossil fuels have been uh, the, that theory has been pretty well disproved. Yeah, but the the abalic the, oil is just what we've been talking about. That's just right, the name exactly. that was given to Every, the everything that we're discussing right now is abiotic bio, meaning life. So a anti, it's it's not created from old life matter. Essentially, it's not. Uh, you know, it's not a dinosaur. So, you know, and somebody, uh, just to follow up on this, uh, somebody asked this question. If oil is made from decomposed dinosaurs and plastic is made from oil, are plastic dinosaurs made from real dinosaurs? 
I have heard that somebody asked that one time. That that is very funny. <laughs> so, or 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 does this question use a number of false presumptions? And obviously, it does use a number of false presumptions because if this is a uh, product of vulcanization, which it appears to be, which it appears that is just part of the the Earth itself, and not part of you know, oh well, there were only so many dinosaurs that lived, so we're going to run out of fuel in the next you know six weeks here. Um, then it you know it it it. It changes all of the presumptions that we base such questions on, even if they're funny. But uh, mm -hmm. apparently, no, a plastic dinosaur is not made from a decomposed old dinosaur. It's actually made, you know, but that's not to say that dinosaurs didn't get stuck in the tar. <laughs> <laughs> I've asked a couple of my uh my geologist friends some questions like can you give me a an answer why the oceans are salty is there like if i take salt and i put it in a glass with water yes there'll be a bit of dilution but a lot of the salt will stay where is that salt coming from if the earth is covered if 70 80 percent of the surf of the surface is covered with water Where's that salt coming from? Right. How did it get there? Well, you Nobody know, and, 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 and with that question, where did the, or with that, you know, idea or issue, where did the story of fossil fuels originate? I, again, that was John D. Rockefeller and the, um, oh, there was a conference in Geneva, Switzerland in 18, I think it was 1892. And... He had lobbied for, this was a scientific conference, and they were to discuss how they were going to classify oil. And he had lobbied with them, probably through major contributions, to have it, lo have it listed as a fossil fuel so that scarcity, meaning that it's only produced to limited amounts, it's based on decaying biomatter, you know, no, and what's the what's the poor oil company? I think uh, back east isn't it in New Jersey that's going to use the dinosaur for their logo. I mean, they're screwed now. Once this gets yeah, that, out, that was that was actually an Oklahoma company called Sinclair. Oil. Sin yeah, <laughs> sin I thought it. Yeah, I was just going to say Sinco. So, uh -huh. uh, you know, and and they've got. Uh, I know they've got gas stations all over New Jersey with that uh, you know fossil fuel dinosaur logo. So I mean, you know, companies like that they're going to go the way of the dinosaur now with this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so and, and they've they've been they're just desperate and have been desperate, obviously, for 120 years, to find a way to convince the public that it is scarce. And even today, where where we say, well, there's no oil here. It's in the Northeast. Oh, there's no oil for a couple hundred miles. Pennsylvania, there's oil, but in parts of New Jersey where I'm at, there's none. No, there's oil here too. It's you just got to go a little deeper to find it. You got to you got to dig under all, all those oil tanks in uh, Newark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably would have to go down 25 30,000 feet to hit oil here. Oh yeah. I was thinking more like 20 or 30 feet underneath. I'm just making a joke though about you know I have been parts I have been of Newark are pretty dirty. <laughs> I was told by a uh, geologist friend of mine up in Canada that there is a formation that is 300 miles wide and over 1200 miles long that runs from the from almost Alaska all the way down into Montana that there's probably enough oil in that one formation alone that we could have all of our current worldwide needs could be met with that one oil formation for the next 2 or 300 years but it's deep it's over 35,000 feet below the surface and that it's a challenge to in deep drilling. It's a challenge. But again, these are because you're dealing with tremendous amount of heat, pressure and forces down there when you get that deep. So and there are also some fears that if you drill that far that deep, you might open up a volcanic, you know, event where there wasn't a volcano before and now you've created one. Because if you've got tremendous amounts of gases and pressures down there, it's 
you know, it's going to be like popping a balloon. That pressure is going to release. And that could be a very dangerous, unfortunate thing. But the Russians have been down as my understanding, they've been down as far as 35,000 feet. And they've told the whole world that doesn't matter where you, where you drill. If you go deep enough, you'll hit oil. So. All right. So, yeah, 35,000 feet down. Wow. That's like. That's deep. Seven miles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's wow. really, really deep. And I live, know, I live, uh, I live about 30, 40 miles from the peak of Mount Sangergonio, and that's 11.5. So that's threefold that peak, is what I was mm -hmm. just, you know, trying to put that in my mind. So, you know, when you're, a, you're, when you're flying at 35,000 feet in an airplane and <laughs> looking down at, at ocean level, that's how deep. That's, that's how deep they have to go in to hit mass amounts of oil you know? uh, all right so let's uh switch gears for a little bit and let's go into renewable energy creation and the mining of rare earths now this is when people talk about pollution creating this this is this, this is, is it the king. this is this is perhaps the most so uh, so so, so people world. with their their with their smartphones, their Toyota Priuses, with their 80,000 mile batteries. I, I mean, they're the Toyota Pius, it, it, you know, excuse me. Mm -hmm. uh, boy, if I get stuck behind another fool driving 50 in the left lane, <laughs> uh, you know, in one of those, boy, you know, staring at their little thing with a whole traffic jam. Literally, every time I get on the damn freeway, I get stuck with somebody in the left lane driving 50 in a damn Prius. Mm -hmm. to, to see it for themselves, it just people just go to YouTube and just type in toxic lakes in China and the vast areas that have been utterly destroyed. So, uh, so while they think that they're eliminating their carbon footprint and they're, you know, uh, you know, by gentle stepping with their Birkenstocks, they are uh, saving the planet and causing less pollution when, in fact, they're causing far more. And if, if I recall correctly, the most fuel-efficient car from factory to end of life was a Jeep CJ7 with a Chevy V8 engine in it. Is that correct? It's, I think I've heard that before. I don't you know. And again, I have not checked that myself, so people don't quote me on that. But because the Jeep has obviously been made for about, what, 70, 80 some years now, you know, and, and the, the, the production line of them and the Wranglers has been so continuous with so few changes for so many decades. And, uh, you know, obviously back in the CJ days, AMC didn't make good engines. <laughs> 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 so, so that's why the Chevy engine. But, um, you know, apparently this from from factory to to junkyard was uh, one of the most efficient vehicles put out as far as a uh, full, you know, the total amount of pollution. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, the amount of pollution that's created by these green technologies, people just don't want to hear it. Also, the amount of energy that it takes to produce the rare earth minerals and the actual green technologies themselves, like the solar panels and the windmills, it takes more energy from oil to produce and do the rare earth mining, to manufacture, produce, ship, and sell the solar panels and windmills than what those, what those uh, the energy that those uh, items will ever produce. Okay, for instance, let's say to give you a solar panel might take or might produce through its life, let's say, and I don't know the exact figure, but let's say it's a thousand BTUs of energy are going to be created by one solar panel in its lifespan. Well, they don't tell you that to create that solar panel, so you can have it on your roof, took 1,200 BTUs from oil. So you're in All right, net so loss. Let me ask you somebody. BTUs. Now, somebody, let's say uh, my co author on the Manufacturing the Deadhead article, and he's my co host for my other show on uh, the CCN network, uh, Unspun. Now, he's got a Nissan Leaf, 
and he's got solar panels on the roof and he doesn't buy gas. And he mm -hmm. says, you know, I haven't, you know, needed to buy fuel for three, four years now. So, you oh, know, good. to him, he's totally off of the system. What can you say to that? It's good. I have no problem with people I'm not saying that we shouldn't produce it. There are certain people that need to be off grid. Say they live in an area where they're away from uh, electric power lines. It's just not possible. But, but now, to to but if we were, you know, to go with this idea of these people that want to create solar panels for the highways of America, for instance, they want to turn the actual <laughs> highways into solar panels. The amount of petroleum used to mine all of that would probably far exceed any benefit of the solar panels and then there would be the upkeep of those solar panels uh you know every 10 or 15 years or whatever and more and more uh that uh, so these and and not only that but these things being in the sun all of the time would would break down making roads out of solar panels which is just glass talk about what that those gla the, the trucks would wear that glass down fast and as soon as they got, as soon as they got wet, they, you would be, it would be like driving on ice, regardless of the time of year. So it's a bad idea. It'll never work. They'll produce a few sidewalks out of it and malls and you can put them on your roof and have, those are fine. I'm all for, you know, people being able to. So you, know, you just think there should be a balance. fine line or a fine balance, essentially, between the production of solar panels and how much, you know, advertising of this is a supposedly clean energy source versus the real damage and production that's done behind it. I mean, there are, you know, all of this needs full disclosure, in other words. And, hey, you know, you're creating this much pollution by buying these solar panels. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so you're going to need to run these solar panels for the next 35 or 40 years to break even on the pollution level. Exactly. And they're very expensive. Look, we just need to stop. We need to stop with all of this propaganda nonsense. The oil industry needs to step up and stop it. Uh, they need to start speaking, stop falling into this. Of course, this is going to happen because this was part of corporate governance. And the things that have gone on, and they're, they're too far gone, I think, to help. But somebody's got to stand up and say, look, this oil is a natural substance. Yes, it will build you solar panels. It can build you, build you windmills. But let's not kid ourselves. We're using more oil to create those things than the energy those items produce. And they should only be built for the specific areas where they would be needed. But to try to provide or meet the energy needs of our society with these harebrained ideas is nothing more than this is all make work projects. Gotcha. You know? Okay. That's all it is. They're just trying to we'll keep everybody, a new energy. you know, and, uh, and to give the hippies work that they can feel proud about essentially while they're being misled. Exactly. All and right. They just be honest. And, well, you know, sure. And, and, you know, and we discussed uh, biofuels before. So, and you said you agree with hemp and biofuels to an extent. What about corn and soy, et cetera, and all these GMO crops out there? Well, I think that I, I, I think this, this GMO stuff is, who knows if we're getting the truth on that from the anti-GMO crowd? Yeah. How much of that is them paying for their own damage control as well? But exactly like uh, is it is it harmful an element i mean are alex jones saying that uh you know they they're blending jellyfish with tomatoes if that's true probably a bad thing but if it's just the blending of two different varieties of tomatoes and coming up with a new hybrid species how is that harmful how is that well, dangerous I, well sure science? i mean they you know i mean obviously when a man and woman come together they create a new hybrid of human being every time and you know exactly <laughs> <laughs> all so, right so i don't know if that's necessarily the bad thing making fuel out of a food source to me that's the height of idiocracy like, why would you do that there's no need for that really it's we can make it out of hemp you know industrial hemp why we're not growing it again it's 
Well, and I was I was the inland em- I was the inland empire coordinator for the California Hemp Initiative, and then uh, of course George Soros came in and funded uh, and now admitted CIA agent uh, Dennis Perone's uh, Prop Two Fifteen campaign that uh, immediately wiped out the California Hemp Initiative. And I remember Jack Herrer being uh, furious about all of this, and he told me exactly what was going to go down and how it was going to go down. And 20-some years later, I look, you know, is what, 96, that the hemp is, the Prop 215, so 19 years since that passed. And uh, <clears throat> everything is exactly how he said it would go down, mm-hmm. that we wouldn't be using hemp, that people would still be going to jail for for, uh, you know, quote-unquote illegal use, while the other half of the population can use it legally, et cetera. And, it, it, you know, and uh, it, it got nowhere. So essentially Soros and Dennis Perone killed the hemp initiative and dazzled everybody with medical marijuana to keep them, uh, you know, keep mm-hmm. them high and content so that they didn't realize what really took place there. That's, uh, at least in my opinion, what appears to have taken place. And then we saw... Dennis Prone also running for governor of California against Dan Lundgren at the same time. Mm-hmm. All right. Do you have something to add to that? No, no. That's it. Just it's exasperating. Right. Uh, let's. What's been going on with that? Let's get into new engine technology and efficiency because obviously this is another problem for the oil companies as well. And as I mentioned in our interview on RBN, I've. Had a number of Jeeps. Yeah, you know, I live in the mountains, and it's either pretty much everybody drives a Jeep or a Subaru. Those are your primary choices. And uh, since my first Jeep, the efficiency has more than doubled, almost tripled, and the horsepower output gone up maybe three or four times uh, since my first, you know, since my first Jeep Wrangler. And uh, just in the last 10 years, they've moved away from a 200, 196 horsepower four liter engine to a 3.6, 300 horsepower engine that gets like five or six miles a gallon more than the four liter did. And so you're getting far more horsepower, far more efficiency, far nicer ride. Now, you know, now uh, a lot of these four bangers are putting out the the horsepower that the V8s were, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, where does that leave the, you know, where does all of this new technology, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Where do we balance the technology versus the, the, the stifling of uh, oil and of human life? Well, I think that if we see oil stay low for long, longer, and it could stay low for years to come if we don't have a war. Then we're going to see the introduction of bigger, bigger cars, so that we can get consuming the gas. So, so we're gonna possible. we're gonna see all of the all of these monster trucks that we saw in the late two thousands that everybody ragged on that completely disappeared and they were traded in for for Toyota Piuses. Uh, we're gonna see the return of of those essentially, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And then that big uh, three-axle uh, Dodge truck that they never rolled out in the 90s. They're probably going to finally roll that sucker out, et cetera. And might as well get people buying as much as they can. I, motor homes, everything else. I- interesting. All right. So, uh, and then, you know, of course, all of that stuff is going to have other pollution. But, you know, what about, and then you have all the synthetic fibers that go into carpets and into upholstery and into all of this stuff. So, isn't that where the real problem repeatedly comes in with the pollution is the petrochemicals and this sort of stuff? Yeah, that's that. Those are problems too, particularly with uh, in the event of fires. They give off uh, very poisonous gases stuff. So, yeah, there are problems with that. I would agree with you. All right, the environmental religion to stop producing. What do you have to say about that? The Agenda 21 communist, communitarian, environmentalist agenda. I'm totally opposed. (laughs) (laughs) What can can you tell us about it, though, other than just that? 
Yeah, obviously they're creating a new Earth religion and, and selling the idea of how petroleum is bad and how carbon is bad when it's actually the foundation of all life. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and they've, just like all the Satanists always do in the Kabbalists, they flip everything upside down. But, you know, what can you, what can you tell us, anything that you can tell us about the inside machinations of that? Other, other than what we've already mentioned before is that I think a lot of the machinations that you're discussing are being brought up. The, the green religions are being capitalized and financed by the oil, many of them by the oil industry itself. And I think Soros is behind a lot of, uh, it appears to be behind a lot of the funding of these uh, earth religions as well. Sure. Well, he's trying to satisfy some geopolitical... So, you know, and, and the ultimate Earth religion, then, apparently, from what you're saying and from what Sean's uh, paper shows that he sent me earlier today, is the real Earth religion, then, is apparently using lots of oil and natural resources. Now, uh, Sean seemed to think that we should be using uh, ethanol. What do you think of that as opposed to uh, petroleum and its more natural states? I, I, you get more of a efficiency burn of the fuel, particularly with the new technologies now, like you're discussing in just in the Jeeps, it's the burn rate, how much of the gases can be burned off in the combustion chamber of the engine. So what Today's is, what is a far more efficiency at burning? Right. Cause you know, and remember in the, in the late seventies and early eighties with the gas shortage and everything and the long lines at the gas station, suddenly we saw Ford Mustangs with uh, four bangers that uh, could barely go 65, 70 miles an hour, right? Right, exactly. So now you can maintain horsepower, even enhanced horsepower, get more efficiency in the burn in the combustion chamber. Well, that's because a lot of the, so, but which, the new fuel you, injection technology. But what do, you, what, do you th what do you think is the primary drawback to something like ethanol? Well, mainly because it's being produced as something that we should be utilizing for food. Right. And well, and then, okay, so then you're going to be using petroleum to run the tractors through the fields to then harvest to make the ethanol. Uh, obviously, they could, you know, there's processes to use the, the oils from the seeds and just pour it straight into the tanks of the tractors, et cetera, as well. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I guess that goes back to your question of how much of the GMO thing is propaganda and them controlling their own. How much of it is really bad that we know of when we're told in one hand it's bad? It, I, there probably is some fairly bad things about it. Is it as harmful or destructive as we've been told? Well, and when we have to be careful that just because the petroleum industry has been using this tack to control, to control their own damage against themselves, their own, you know, against their own fortunes, uh, we can't we can't necessarily was, say that Monsanto, for instance, is is necessarily doing the same thing. So we do need to also be careful and keep it on a point by point basis. Well, I would say that the same people that have brought this, let's call this this uh, industrial or military industrial complex um, propaganda to the oil industry, have also brought it to every other major industry, including Big Agra, which would. So this is what the Madison Avenue, you know, people are probably, you know, creating on the weekends, you know, uh, the, these these reverse advertising campaigns against, you know, for their own clients. Sure. I think they've been doing this for a long time, particularly with the creation of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, after World War II, the Korean War through the 1950s with Cuba. And you see all the misdirection. And these guys were hired by big business to come in and consult to see if they could help them so they can strategize for, you know, competing on a global basis. Right. You know, what we should have said at the beginning of the show is that you're actually sitting on an oil rig and, you know, with all of the stuff in the background. That would... <laughs> It does kind of look like it's just <laughs> some old shells with old stuff. I know. I'm just. <laughs> all right. So. What are emissions and how can they be controlled? Well, emissions are the burning of fuel in uh, either a combustion chamber or in a furnace. And it's the byproduct of, of the burnt gases themselves. There's, there's always ash, elements of debris. And there's also the creation of other gases in the burning process, such as CO2. 
as well as other compounds that get released into the air. Now, CO2, that's a big pollutant that uh, the trees breathe, and then they give off oxygen, which is another pollutant. Is that correct? That, that humans <laughs> and animals breathe. I mean, that's that's what the, these Agenda 21, UN people, et cetera, want us all to believe is that CO2 is a pollutant, and then therefore, you know, we're a pollutant because we give off CO2, and then, you know, plants, additional plants would obviously be a, an additional pollutant because they would give off oxygen that would then promote more living organisms. Mm -hmm. Listen, I could tell you that one of the big myths that we have been told about is the world population. Right. Well, you know, and until I go around and personally verify the population in every city and state and country, I don't believe it. You know, I know, I know their agenda. They've been lying to us about world population numbers. They have been falling. And we probably hit our peak population in the mid-90s. From the time of the cavemen all the way until today, humanity continues to exist because each generation of people has produced another generation to replace itself. Scientists have figured out how many people need to be born each generation to replace the generation before. That number is one person per person. All things being equal, this creates perfect demographic balance. Since women are the only ones who can have children, replacing every person on Earth means each woman needs to have two children, one to replace her, and the other to replace the man, who cannot have children. The total fertility rate is the average number of children each woman in a society is having. This number shows us if a society is growing or shrinking. In developed countries, the replacement rate birth rate is 2.1 children per woman. This will keep the population stable, but even that is assuming that every woman has children, and that there are no wars, famines, or disease. In the real world, disasters happen all the time, and sadly not all children reach adulthood, especially in poor countries. This pushes their replacement rate up to 3.3 children per woman. Since not every woman wants to have children, in order to keep the population stable, some women need to have more than 2.1 children to balance the birth rate with the women who are only having one, or no children at all. Maintaining this balance is of the utmost importance. If society does not at least replace itself every generation, human numbers begin to fall exponentially. Economic and social problems appear, as elderly people retiring begin to outnumber young people entering the workplace. This is already happening all over the developed world. Many of the world's nations are only barely replacing themselves, while a growing majority have birth rates below replacement, some as low as 1.8 or even 1.2 babies per woman. Many societies are facing a very real danger. Extinction. With the dollarization of the world and everything being financialized to the teeth, um, in this country and in all Western developing countries that encompasses China today, as well as India and others, that it requires two incomes to support a household. And that, that prevents women from having four or five children. They can't go on four or five maternity leaves in most cases. They can't advance in their careers. Well, and that's the whole idea. Take... You, you get them out of the home and you get them career focused so that by the time they figure out that that was the whole plan in the first place, they're 35 or many of them 40, 45 years old. And by the time they find someone or can get their act together, it's too late to have a family. Exactly. You, you know, and that's the, that's the whole point. And, you, you know, and I've found that in uh, Huxley's documents and in CFR documents and in population control documents, et cetera, eugenics documents, that that was the intended plan of that. Now, let's get into chemicals and gasoline versus natural distilling. <coughs> Excuse me. Chemicals in gasoline, they add a whole bunch of chemicals to gasolines to, you know, for winterization formulas, for summer, to cut emissions, and, and, uh, what do they call it, MBNTs during winter months. Um, many of these things are just not necessary. And they're simply make work projects to, for uh, petrochemical divisions. To, uh, so, like here in California, the, the the high detergent levels that you see in the gasoline, and we discussed this last time as well, 
And then, uh, you know, and then these detergents in the gasoline, like, you know, California gas prices. What is New Jersey's gas price right now? Uh, we're for regular. We're about two eighty, two eighty a gallon. You mean uh, one eighty? I'm sorry, one eighty. Okay, because right. California, we're at about uh, two sixty nine in most places, roughly right now. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, this uh, this extra cost is tax for the state of California, as well as the cost of these detergents. When if they didn't have most of these extra chemicals in them, they wouldn't be near as polluting in the first place. Is that the general idea? Yeah, pretty much. Just everything that's in the oil is natural. It would burn off or it would do very little harm to the environment. Um, they put these chemicals, I think it has more to do with, let's say Exxon has a ke- petrochemical division. They all have petrochemical divisions or are heavily invested in petrochemical, you know, through their CAFRAs and everything else. And they have to sell those petrochemicals because they have to support their, the huge investments and sums of money that have been invested in these operations. So if it, you know, if you got to produce a chemical that you're going to add to gasoline, it does it have, if it has positive effects on performance in the burning of the fuel, yeah, but you see, I'm not that far down the line when it comes to the oil industry. I just get the oil to the refinery, everything to read there, and I could say I get it secondhand. You know, it's my common sense opinion that I'm giving. Right. But I think that you could you could produce natural gasolines, and it, it the gasolines are produced actually in in, in nature. There are there's nephilims and other natural gas. You can punch a hole in the ground, and you'll get gasoline. And you could take that gasoline and put it in your car, and your car will run great on it. You know. All right. What about what about na- uh, liquid natural gas? Liquid natural gas is it's another. It's great. It's uh, you know it's very very low emissions. Um, it, there's a tremendous amount of it that we can uh, that we can extract. Um, it's really what it is. It's methane. Methane gases that are produced, uh, you know, deep inside the earth. Um, so are you, what you're saying is that uh, cows farting isn't the sole source of <laughs> me- methane gas? No, because I, I thought it was the farmers that were and the ranchers that were producing all that. I mean, if you go by the vegan propaganda, isn't that where methane comes from? Cow farts? That's that's what we're told, aren't we? What? There are gas, methane that pours out of fissures on the ground, around us, in the oceans. There's a crack in the Atlantic, off the Atlantic coast, that runs from Maine to off the coast of Georgia, okay, right through the Carolinas in Georgia. And scientists have been watching this crack for years, and they know there's oil and natural gas out there. And there's methane bubbles that are bubbling out. You know, this is only a few hundred feet down. So the earth farts like cows then. Like cows, cows do. But I am, I think what's happening is they, they're taking it seriously because of what happened with those tsunamis in Indonesia back about 10 years ago or 2004. Mm-hmm. Where there was a crack there off in the Indian Ocean. And this was just like we have here on the East Coast. And when that gave way... And you had the ocean floor drop by 10 or 15 feet along that crack because it was a massive release of pressure. And you get a mega tsunami and then uh, in the New York City is, you You'd know. have a tsunami, uh, <laughs> massive tsunamis up and down the East Coast, which would literally, if that were to happen, if we had something like that Indonesian thing, the cat, we would. It would, it would solve the, uh, the, the oil consumption problem. <laughs> Population f- over capacity. It would be. You'd have to rebuild the entire East Coast. The wave could probably wash over, probably would wash over the entire state of Florida. Right. You know, Florida's only, um, what, I think its highest is 70 feet above sea level. <laughs> really? So yeah, I, I'm, at, I'm at, I'm at, I'm at, I'm at, I'm at 4,800 feet right now. I'm in a place called Rim of the World. So, <laughs> Oh, wow, you're up there. You're well, up there. you know, and, and the peak on, on this uh, particular mountain 
Ridge is eleven five. That's Mount Sangargonio. So, oh, all right. So, uh, fracking a good or a bad thing, and why? And you know, I know you hear all the the problem. You hear people being able to light their water on fire because, and again, this is you talked about your friend's clean fracking process versus all the chemicals and stuff that they've been using in fracking. And and so, what's the deal with fracking? Fracking is not nearly as bad as we've been told. Are there problems with it? Yes. Could it get better? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's always... Is it getting better? We're being, we're being made and are continuing to be made. Improving in efficiencies and the chemicals are used for in the fracking process to prop open the rocks. There's... They use... Uh, even in conventional drilling, which has never been a problem around the world, some of the chemicals they use pretty much standard, but they're toxic and they could cause a lot of problems. And again, I think the oil industry has created their own demonizing propaganda machines and maybe to scare people. Well, you know, scare and, people and also to, to acquire mineral rights and drilling rights for what better way to. Um, what better way to go into a depressed area, let's say like rural Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, where property values are, have always been low, okay? And have a accident at a farm where somebody has agreed for, to, for royalty payments and is doing pretty well and it winds up polluting an aquifer or something to chase everybody away, drive the property values down and then come in with a secondary company buy up the, everything up for pennies on the dollar, and now they don't have to pay the royalties. I, I don't, this, this is business. This is the way things have been done. This is this military intelligence model right. that all of these big companies are operating under. Right. And they're not being good stewards, and that's what we have to change. We've got to get this sickness, which is a mental disease more than anything, out of our heads. It's If, uh, if somebody owns the land, what's... And the, look, there are many, many, many people that their lives greatly improved because of fracking. I'm talking about people that allowed the drillers to come onto their land. These were people that were very depressed, who making very little, who were even in risk of losing everything because the economies that they, in the communities they live in are depressed. The oil companies came in and brought a tremendous amount of prosperity, improved all of the schools, the roads, the bridges, and the, uh, you know, the, and it, that never would have happened without, without the fracking. And, and people were able to, you know, buy new homes and send their kids to college and were living a decent life. And I, I, I personally, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. For, so the, for, the issue isn't fracking. The issue is the chemicals in the fracking and the process, the specific process, and obviously... Again, that can be changed with minimal to no chemicals by your friend's new process, increasing production. Mm -hmm. And then, now, uh, Steve, so obviously these people would get higher royalties. Right. Now let me address the methane in the water, okay? These guys drill down thousands of feet below water reservoirs, okay? Now if you have the veil, you know, they always start vertical where they go straight down and then they horizontal 90 degrees, and they go out some far, sometimes as far as 12,000 feet on the horizontal leg. And they say they claim that because they go through aquifers, that gases or methane will leak through the casings. And in some cases, with <clears throat> contractors trying to cut corners and not using the proper concrete, what they call their slope, their tensile strength, that would be subject to cracking. You could have situations where methane could leak into an aquifer. But other than that, it's highly unlikely that the methane that is in some of these wells actually came from the fracking. And again, this goes back to this whole military intelligence model that they're doing. It. So apparently, mm -hmm. I have read that many people in rural Pennsylvania where they've had problems with methane in their water have had that for, have had that problem for well over 30 years, long before the frackers came into town. So the methane is obviously leaking up into aquifers from fissures, 
which are just natural. And if that happens, you know, horrible. Um, but, you know, fracking did not bring that problem about. They, many, many people out there had that problem long before fracker showed up. Got it. All right. Matt asks, why are fossil fuels worth so much more to the powers that be than, say, just switching over to cleaner energy technologies and controlling the world's access to them instead? And I think we've probably cleared up this question. <laughs> but did, have you, you know, it, it's obvious, you know, and I, I, I posted the comment, if they can keep us asking, you know, from Thomas Pynchon, if they can keep us asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. And so uh, when you realize that uh, the petroleum is the cleaner technology that they have been covering up and propagandizing to influence their own profits, then we can see the real agenda here. And, uh, and of course, that it's not a fossil fuel, that it's uh, from vulcanization. All right, so do you know anything about thorium? Thorium, now you're getting into nuclear. Right? All right. So I don't know too much about it other than it's, um, well, there make claims that thorium reactors are far cleaner and safer than uranium or plutonium reactors. Um, if that's true, I'm all for it. I think the, that nuclear is, should be what we should have gone to 50 years ago, but which so were the, the small portable nuclear reactors, not like the big one at San Clemente or at yeah, Long Island I'm or only, something. I'm only talking about what they call small modular reactors, SMRs. Okay. What they power nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers. And and, and and so when because and you should make that distinction too, because when people think of nuclear reactors, they think of a San Clemente or a you know, or a Long Island, et cetera, a nuclear reactor or, or, you know, Chernobyl or Fukushima, et cetera. Sure. And so Those, we're, we're way beyond that technology now, but that, that information is suppressed as well. Is that correct? Well, those reactors were built to support the grid. All of these energy systems were built on a grid basis and trillions of dollars has been invested in it moving electricity from one part of a country to another. Right, All which is the which then it would be unnecessary if everybody had a portable nuclear mo module in their in their region essentially. Exactly, one of these one SMR can power over 20,000 homes. They they're they're completely um, transportable. So they could be moved uh, by truck or ship. I mean, they're in re these reactors are in submarines and and aircraft carriers now. And so, obviously, uh, these things are, are closed living quarters. People are underwater, et cetera, with these things. And we don't hear of, you know, nuclear I, – I suppose maybe there have been nuclear accidents on submarines, but you don't hear of it very often. No, and I've talked to a few people that were uh, – I know a couple of people that worked on reactors and nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers, and they worked with them for 20 years and never had any problems. They're – they're very safe. They're very efficient. But they knew this back when they first developed for the Navy, for the uh, uh, for the Polar or the Poseidon. What was it? The Polaris submarine. They realized that they can make them smaller. That this technology wouldn't support the grid. It would actually eliminate the need for the grid. And now you know why nuclear was demonized. They didn't want to completely eliminate it. See, they never did. They just scaled back its production and construction because they only wanted it to supplement, you know, coal-burning uh, coal electric power plants. They were also doing resource recovery plants where garbage incinerators in an attempt to sure. try and... Well, you know, and I, I've, I used to uh, have a friend who was a power plant operator, and I've toured a lot of these plants. You know, the big uh, trash burner plant in Long Beach, there's a... There's a uh, plant in uh, Fontana, California, that runs off of uh, jet engines burning natural gas, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, natural gas plants now, and all in an effort really to support and keep the current grid going. But this, Interesting. this was not really ever the grid idea in itself made sense 
prior to nuclear energy coming along, but the development of the SMR uh, would have made the grid impractical and trillions would have been, in those days, hundreds of billions would have been lost. Although, and, but it lost to in certain sections, but uh, created in others, just not the direction that they wanted the control of power and wealth to go. Well, in those days, it was far more about there was far more loyalty to preserving jobs here. For sure, we didn't we didn't have China producing everything. Right, we're now absolutely. sourcing our labor. So if you're talking about taking an entire industry that everybody in this country is dependent upon, just about, and destroying that industry, where an industry that has millions of employees, uh, coast to coast, um, supports numerous other industries, you know, every from manufacturers, welders, you know, carpenters, landscape, you name it, the electricity hires them all, electric power generating. And to bring in small modular reactors, you would literally be displacing all of those people. And so the decision was made that though this is a good idea, we can't have it. But you also can't let that decision be made organically. By right. Well, and, well, and at the same time, though, the the, power, the 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 amount of electricity available is going down, and the price is continually going up. And it seems like it would be a good time to finally implement these things. Well, that's where we were talking before. It's when we first started, when I said that only profits are only generated through scarcity, okay, not through surpluses. Right. We got surpluses, prices fall, but in scarcity, prices always rise. Well, you know, so but right now the, the public flourishes and people travel and do a lot more things when gas is, you know, at $2 a gallon versus at 4 50 at or 440 like it was here in california mm -hmm. so uh all right uh and here's another question from a listener darren asks could oil be some sort of lubricant for the earth's tectonic plates i believe so absolutely now you'd have to believe in the tectonic plate theory in order for that and again that's all just theories but yeah it could be something the earth produces as it's as a lubricating uh, lubricating factor, tectonic shifting is all part of the vulcanization process. This this thing could be a, it's alive, right? What we call alive, it's constantly moving, it's in motion, it's never it never ceases, it doesn't stop, and it needs oil to do that. It needs to produce oil in order to make that make that possible. And then Sean, the uh, geophysicist, says that the depolymerized and oxidized carbon dioxide, which is released by pyrolysis, heating of kerogen, the abiotic source of uh, source rock for coal, oil, and gas, is the basis for the majority of the carbon-based life on Earth. I concur with them a thousand percent. And I think that's a good point to wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was a pleasure, Jan. Likewise, and, and I, stuff. yeah, and I appreciate you coming back on, and uh, maybe we can think about doing a, I don't know if we could put together a whole hour, hour and a half on nuclear, but uh, maybe we can do that sometime and discuss uh, Fukushima and the the propaganda about nuclear energy and and all of that as well. And you and I have discussed before that there is a significant amount of propaganda around that. So tremendous. That's that's a whole new world because they've been trying to keep that genie in the bottle and get a lot of of uh, mileage from the propaganda created by the, the nuclear scare. They've been at this for a long time, but yeah. they're losing. They are losing their grip. It's amazing it took this long for them to lose their grip. It just shows you how good they were. But I, I see it all the time. It usually takes fifty to seventy years for any of these scandals to finally break surface to the public. You know. You know, it's it's funny. I never saw it before. It was so obvious. You've seen those. Uh, there was something uh, it was a program I was watching yesterday afternoon about uh, Cuba and the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the images of the nuclear bombs being exploded. It's 
you just look at that now and you realize just how fake all those things were. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all, and they're still showing it to us. Sure. You've been watching it your whole life and you were like, oh my God, it looks horrendous. But now it's just, it's all, it was all just done in, in Laurel Canyon. Yeah, these were all studio fake things that were created for the movies and are still being promoted all these years later. <clears throat> and what made me think about it was years ago. There was uh, just a couple of years ago. Let's be real quick. There was a, uh, a guy filming in Indonesia. A volcano was erupting in an island, a small island in Indonesia, and happened to be filming it from a boat. They were several miles away. So the island was about four or five miles away. But he happened to capture the moment when this island just went ba-boom and exploded in a massive, massive explosion. You could see the pressure wave coming across the water. And there's nothing anybody could do on this boat. And when it hit the boat, the camera shaking and the... the, the you know, the, the ear piercing sound of the explosion and all of the clouds around it at 30,000 feet just opened up. Okay. Like it, now this is just a volcano. This wasn't a, this certainly wasn't a volcanic eruption on the level of, let's say a Mount Pinatubo. Okay. This was a small Island that you were, you were safe five miles away from. So we're not talking about a massive, Sure. explosion on a volcanic level here and the clouds the clouds say so must have been five seven thousand feet okay that's about what clouds are they can go like 10 or you know high clouds but sure. these clouds were and that that explosion just blew all those clouds away and the sky all of a sudden opened up blue because that pressure just pushed all those clouds away go back and look at those explosions with those nukes going off and tell me if you see any cloud movement the clouds don't move. Interesting. Those are fake. Because it would be impossible. When you see the trees blowing over and all this, that's the – so if that's the case in a small volcanic explosion, it is blowing clouds all over, just dissipating them, then the same exact thing should be taking place in nuclear explosions. And there's not a single one of those films where you see any cloud moving whatsoever. Interesting. So. All right, Greg, Just until next crazy. time, and uh, we'll, we'll think about uh, or plan on doing something on that. I'm sure there's plenty to explore there, and thank you so much for coming. <laughs> thank you, Jan. Uh, oh, and by the way, uh, do you have a website or anything if people want to contact you? Uh, well, my company website is zeneor.com, Z-E-N-E-O-R.com. That is my company website. talks about what I do in the oil industry. Uh, aside from that, I'm, I'm just an average Joe. Try, right. I'm the average squirrel trying to get a nut in the world, right? That's what we like All to right. say. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. <laughs> Take care. Thanks. Enjoy your nut. Bye-bye. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>